Before we can take our next step in our exploration of general orbital perturbations, which will involve deriving a set of potential-based perturbation functions to complement the force-based Gauss perturbation equations, we need to reacquaint ourselves or acquaint ourselves with Hamiltonian mechanics, and in particular with Hamilton's equations and the Hamilton-Jacobi equations. In our review, we demonstrated how we could arrive at the Euler-Lagrange equations starting from Hamilton's principle, and noted that Hamilton's principle is effectively encoding the same physics as Newton's second law. That means that we should be able to arrive at the same Euler-Lagrange equations starting from Newton's second law, and we will use that as our entry point into our derivation of Hamilton's equations. Recall our basic setup. A system of n particles with k constraints has 3n minus k degrees of freedom, and thus can be fully described by 3n minus k independent variables, which we call the generalized coordinates, q1 through q3n minus k. Particle positions are defined implicitly via generalized coordinates, and so the position vector of the jth particle, r sub j, can be written as a function r sub j of the generalized coordinates q1 through q3n minus k and time. If we describe the positions of particles via Cartesian coordinates, that is, the Cartesian components of an inertial frame representation of some position vector r is given by the components x sub i, then we know that we can write each of these components, x sub i, also as functions of the generalized coordinates and time. And that means that the total derivative of each of these components is given by the sum of all of the partial derivatives of that coordinate with respect to the generalized coordinates times the total derivatives of the generalized coordinates plus the partial in time, times the total derivative in time. We now consider a virtual displacement of one of these position vectors, which we will call delta r sub j. This is an infinitesimal instantaneous displacement that is always consistent with the constraints of the system. We therefore can write it also as the sum of the partials of the position vector with respect to all the generalized coordinates times these virtual displacements of the generalized coordinates. And you will note that in this case, there is no time derivative because this is an infinitesimal and instantaneous displacement and therefore has no time dependence. We next write D'Alembert's formulation of Newton's second law which starts simply by writing Newton's original second law as the force acting on particle j minus the inertial derivative of the linear momentum of particle j is equal to zero. If we dot this system with the virtual displacements delta r sub j and sum over all particles, we get the expression, the sum over the collection of n particles of f sub j, the force acting on the jth particle, minus the inertial derivative of the linear momentum of the jth particle, dotted into the virtual displacement on the jth particle, all equals zero. And this is known as D'Alembert's formulation of Newton's second law. The key utility of this comes when you split forces, these f sub j's, into active forces and constraint forces. The key point here is that constraint forces do no work under virtual displacements. And so D'Alembert's formulation can equivalently be written as applying only to the active forces, only to those forces that are not forces of constraints. And this now is known as D'Alembert's principle. It is incredibly important to note that this does not imply that these active forces are exactly equivalent to the inertial derivatives of the linear momentum. These three quantities, the active forces, the inertial derivatives of the linear momenta, and the virtual displacements are not necessarily mutually independent. D'Alembert's principle only tells us that this specific relationship holds. And what this allows us to do is to project the equations of motion only onto those directions in which applied forces are actually doing work. And there's no new physics being done here. There's only a different mathematical description of the same Newtonian physics that we've been using all along. So let's explore the implications of this. The inertial velocity of particle j is equal to the inertial derivative 
of the position of particle J and in terms of the generalized coordinates can be written as the sum of the partial derivatives of the position vector R sub J with respect to each of the generalized coordinates, Q sub K, and here we're just using K as an index variable, times the time derivatives of each of those generalized coordinates plus the partial of R sub J in time. Similarly, we can rewrite D'Alembert's principle as the sum of all of the active forces dotted into the virtual displacements minus the sum of the linear momentum derivatives dotted into those same virtual displacements. So all we've done so far is just distribute this dot product over this vector subtraction. From this first term, we can write that the sum over all of the active forces dotted into the virtual displacements by substituting in our definition of the virtual displacements is equivalent to the double summation over indices J and K of these active forces dotted into the partials of the position vector R sub J with respect to the generalized coordinates Q sub K times the variation in QK. And from this, we're going to define a new quantity. We're going to say that this entire double summation is the same as a summation over K only of new, a new quantity Q sub K times Delta QK. This capital Q sub K is a generalized force and we will define the Kth generalized force in our system as the sum over all of our particles of the active forces acting on all the particles dotted into the partials of the jth particle position vector with respect to the kth generalized coordinate. We now consider the second term of this equation. And again, we rewrite this single summation over the inertial derivatives of the linear momenta dotted into their virtual displacements as the double summation over jk of the inertial linear momenta derivatives, which we, by Newton's second law, can write as the masses of the particles times these derivatives of the velocities of the particles under the assumption that the masses are constant in time, dotted into the partial of R sub J with respect to Q sub K times the delta QK value. As a brief aside, note that the total derivative in time of m sub j times the inertial velocity of particle j dotted into the partial of the position of particle j with respect to generalized coordinate qk is, again, assuming that the mass is constant in time, the same as the mass times the inertial derivative of the velocity dotted into dr dqk plus the mass times the inertial velocity dotted into the time derivative of this partial of r sub j with respect to q sub k. If we consider just this term, we can always switch the order in which we take these derivatives, since derivative is a strictly linear function. And that means that the total derivative in time of the partial of R sub J with respect to Q sub K is the same as the partial with respect to Q sub K of the total derivative in time of R sub J. And so we can write, that this entire term is the same as the summation over a third index L of the second partial of R sub J with respect to Q sub K, Q sub L times the total derivative of Q sub L in time, plus the second partial of R sub J with respect to time and Q sub K. And if you stare at this long enough, you should be able to convince yourself that this is exactly equal to the partial in Q sub K of the inertial velocity J. As another aside, let's think about the expression partial with respect to the time derivative of Q sub K. So this over dot is the same as dQK dt of the inertial velocity of particle J. This expression can be written as the partial in Q dot K of the sum over L of the partial of R sub J with respect to QL times dQL dt or QL dot plus the partial of R sub J in time. And again, staring at this, you should be able to convince yourself that this is exactly equivalent to the partial of RJ with respect to QK.
Therefore, this term of our total derivative of mj vj dotted into dr dq can be written as the scalar time derivative of mj times the inertial velocity of the jth particle dotted into the partial of that velocity with respect to q dot k minus mj times the inertial velocity of j dotted into the partial of vj with respect to just qk. The reason for doing this is that this is exactly the term that arises in our d'Alembert expression. We can directly plug this back into our statement of d'Alembert's principle, which you will recall was given here. This second term of our expression exactly gives rise to our newly found expression. And so putting it all together, we can rewrite d'Alembert's principle as That is, our original statement of D'Alembert's principle, the sum over all of our particles of the difference between the active forces and the inertial derivatives of the linear momenta of each particle dotted into the virtual displacement of each particle is equal to zero. You'll note that we flipped the order of these two terms here from before, but we can do that because the right-hand side of this is zero, and so we can just multiply everything by negative one. We now can expand this statement into zero is equal to the sum over j and k of the scalar derivative of the mass of the jth particle times the inertial velocity of the jth particle dotted into the partial of that inertial velocity with respect to q dot k minus the mass times the velocity dotted into the partial of the velocity with respect to the generalized coordinate k all multiplied by the variation in the generalized coordinate k and then we still have our first term from before, which is just the sum of all of the generalized forces of the system multiplied by the displacements of the generalized coordinates. Recalling that the kinetic energy is given by the sum over all the particles of their masses over two times the norms of their inertial velocities squared, we can now rewrite D'Alembert's principle as The sum over all of the generalized coordinates using index L from one to three and minus K of the expression scalar derivative in time of the partial of the kinetic energy with respect to the time derivative of the Lth generalized coordinate minus the partial of the kinetic energy with respect to the Lth coordinate minus the generalized force Q sub L all multiplied by the virtual displacement in the generalized coordinate L has to be equal to zero. Another key concept here that we've carried through all of this is that the generalized coordinates are independent. They are the minimal coordinate set that describes your system. And so the Q sub Ls can each be varied separately. The variation in the first generalized coordinate is entirely independent from the variation in the second generalized coordinate. And what that means is that every one of the arguments of the summation has to individually go to zero in order for the whole summation to go to zero. And so we've once returned to something that looks a lot like the euler lagrange equations, except in this case, we've written it only as a function of kinetic energy and these generalized forces. Once again, let's pause and make the point that even though this is a strictly scalar set of equations, they are based on inertial velocity vectors. You can never get away from making sure that you're working in an inertial frame. As a final step, let us consider the case where the generalized forces, Q sub L, are themselves conservative forces and can be derived from a potential function. So what we're saying is, in the case of conservative forces, Q sub L can be written as, that is, the Lth generalized force, which we've previously defined as the sum over all of the particles of their forces dotted into the partial of R sub J with respect to Q sub L. Now we can write this f sub j as negative the gradient of a potential function v, which means that this summation becomes negative the sum over j of the partial of the potential function with respect to the position r sub j dotted into the partial of the position with respect to coordinate q sub l. And this entire thing is just the partial of v with respect to q sub l, because these terms cancel out. For conservative forces, this potential 
is going to be independent of the time derivatives of the generalized coordinates. So we know that if we're dealing with a strictly conservative system, we can make the statement that the partial of V with respect to Q dot L is zero for all generalized coordinates L. And therefore, if we define a quantity L, that is the kinetic energy, which is a function of Q and Q dot and time minus the potential energy, which is a function of Q and time only, and in this case, the Qs and Q dots represent all of the generalized coordinates, then we can write the time derivative of the partial of this L, which is known as the Lagrangian, with respect to the time derivatives of the generalized coordinates, minus the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized coordinates, is equal to zero for every generalized coordinate. And here now we have the form of the Euler-Lagrange equations that we are most familiar with and that we previously got directly from Hamilton's principle. Let's also consider the case where we have non-conservative forces. We can actually, in certain cases, just stick any non-conservative forces on the right-hand side of the Euler-Lagrange equations. The restriction is that these have to be of a specific form, namely, that is, we have to be able to write these non-conservative generalized forces as functions of some function u, which is a function of the generalized coordinates and their time derivatives, that looks exactly like the euler lagrange equations themselves. So q dot l is equal to the time derivative of partial of this function u with respect to q dot l minus the partial of u with respect to ql. If we can formulate our generalized forces that are non-conservative in this fashion, then we can just stick them on the right-hand side of the euler lagrange equations.